If a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? So I think about this question a lot, and to me the obvious answer is yes. By the way, I know this doesn't really look like a forest. Unfortunately, there was a fire a few months ago, but just use your imaginations. In physics, sound is the vibration of air molecules caused by a disturbance. When you clap, the movement of your hands causes a change of pressure in the air. The air molecules vibrate and hit each other, creating a wave, which we hear as sound. So if a tree falls in the forest, a sound wave is created, so what should it matter if someone hears it? Well, from a neuroscience perspective, this question can get pretty complicated. Oh, Ali, from Neurotransmissions, what are you doing here? First of all, what even is a sound? Do we define a sound as the vibrating waves of air sent off by a tree hitting the ground? Or do we define a sound as the vibration on our eardrums when the sound waves reach them? Or do we define a sound as the noise that our brain perceives when it decodes all the signals it gets from our ears? See, the world exists around us, but our perception of the world isn't objective. Our brains gather information from our senses, but we don't pay attention to everything. Our brains filter things through our memories and our attention, helping us pick out what's important and discarding the rest. I think one could argue that when a tree falls in the forest, it doesn't necessarily make a sound. Because if you define a sound as the thing that your brain recognizes as a tree hitting the ground, without your ears and your brain present, all that you have are vibrating airways. You know, this reminds me of a conversation between Einstein and Niels Bohr. Einstein said, I am convinced that God does not play dice. Do you really think the moon isn't there if you aren't looking at it? To which Bohr replied, Einstein, don't tell God what to do. So Einstein would probably have argued that the tree does make a sound because he believed that observation has no effect on reality. Niels Bohr, on the other hand, was the leader of a theory of quantum physics called the Copenhagen Interpretation, which says that the act of observation can change the way nature behaves. This sort of plays into some ideas of how our brain perceives the world around us. See, it's not instantaneous. It takes time for the vibrations of the airwaves to hit our eardrum, and then to be registered by the neurons in our ears, and then to be passed on to the brain regions responsible for noticing and understanding sounds. So the way we hear a sound might vary depending on where we are, what we're doing, and what kind of experience we've had with the sound before. For example, if you're a lumberjack and you're out cutting down trees every day, you'll probably recognize the sound of a tree falling very quickly. But if you live in an urban environment without many trees, you might think it's a car crash. Now, this doesn't change the fact that it is a tree falling, but it does change how you perceive it, which affects your own understanding of the reality. I've heard other neuroscientists explain it by saying that we're essentially all living in our own virtual reality. Our brain uses the information it gets from the world around us to build a virtual world based on our personal views and experiences. So for each of us, the world is slightly different. Here's probably the most fascinating experiment I learned during my physics undergrad. It basically sparked my interest in quantum physics and uh, it's insane. First, you need to know something about quantum objects like electrons. Sometimes they act like particles and sometimes they act like waves. This is called wave particle duality and actually everything does this, but it's only noticeable when we get down to the world of the tiny. So yeah, there's that. Anyway, a team of scientists at the Wiseman Institute set up an experiment so that electrons would be fired through two slits and hit a blank screen on the other side. First, they covered one, just to see what would happen. Okay, not too crazy an outcome. The electrons passed through the slit and landed on the detector screen just as particles would, with most of them landing just behind the slit. If you think about particles of sand falling through a crack, it's pretty much the same thing, so nothing too crazy here. Next, they opened the other slit. When they fired the electrons again, this appeared. This is called an interference pattern and it's characteristic of wave behavior. If we look at water waves going through a double slit, they interfere with each other, causing peaks and troughs. When these peaks and troughs hit the screen, they create an interference pattern, just like the one we saw with the electrons. This might seem strange to us, but it's actually not that weird a result. It was known for a long time that electrons behave sometimes like particles and sometimes like waves. And the reason they acted like waves this time was because when the second slit was opened, the electrons had something to interfere with. 
each other. So now the scientists wanted to see how far this particle wave thing would go. So they thought, okay, we'll be clever and keep both slits open, but slow down the electron gun so much that only one electron is fired at a time. So only one electron goes through a slit at a time. Can you guess what happened? Take a moment to pause and think about it. All right. Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay, let's speed this up. This is where things start to get weird. Each electron hit the screen as an individual particle, but all together they made an interference pattern. But they're going through the slits one at a time, so what are they interfering with? The scientists were obviously baffled by this, so they decided to investigate by adding a detector near the slits so they could observe which one an electron went through. And when they fired the electrons again... What? The interference pattern disappeared. The electrons behaved like particles. This is crazy, right? Obviously something must be wrong. So the scientists just went and sneakily unplugged the detector. And then this. The interference pattern re-emerged. The fact that something was observing them changed the way the electrons behaved. So what the hell, right? Well, remember the guy from earlier, Niels Bohr? Him and his assistant, Werner Heisenberg, came up with the theory that before things are measured, they exist in all possible states at the same time, a superposition. When they're measured, they're forced to choose one state. This is known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. So going back to our experiment, when the single electrons were fired with no detector, there was nothing measuring which slit they went through. Existing in all possible states at the same time, it was able to go through both slits and interfere with itself. Now, when a detector was placed at the entrance to one of the slits, the act of observing caused its wave function to collapse, so it had to choose a path. It chose one slit and so could no longer interfere with itself. No interference means no interference pattern, so it acts as a particle. Just a quick note, people are often confused by what observing means in this context. It doesn't have to be a person observing. Basically, anything that captures information about what the electron does counts as an observer. Yeah. So, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, if the Copenhagen interpretation is true, we can never know. Like it's fundamentally built into the laws of nature that we can't know. Ah, nature, you feisty feline. So coming back to neuroscience, different experiences color our perception, which in turn affects our understanding. Like I just found out I have this thing called grapheme synesthesia. It's where you associate things like letters, numbers, and days of the week with different colors. Like for me, Monday is blue, Tuesday is orange, Wednesday is green. But I don't have that condition. So my experience is different from Jade's, which means that I'll never fully understand what Jade's experience is like. We've actually done a whole video about that over on Ali's channel, Neurotransmissions. Neurotransmissions is a channel all about your brain. This week we're asking, can humans ever truly be objective? You can check that out in the description or click the card up here. Bye.